and you want to quickly devolve. Yeah. I mean, but like, <laughs> honestly, though, a fun guy. Um, all right, here we go. It's another meeting of the Aperture Photo Book Club and welcome to everyone tuning in. We're so happy you're here. Season two, this time we're talking about Christine Potter's wonderful new book, Dark Waters. And um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Aperture Photo Book Club is something we started to help really ground our own internal conversations and ones with all of you about the things that we love about photo books, about this as a particularly wonderful democratic medium for taking an artist's vision and sharing it with the world. Um, I'm joined tonight but, well, I'm gonna to get to the introductions in a minute, actually. So Aperture uh, published this book and is a 70-year-old nonprofit publisher that has been creating community and conversations around photography since 1952. Uh, we were founded by Dorothea Lang and Ansel Adams and Beaumont and Nancy Newhall and many other, uh, or a handful of other, writers and thinkers and curators who wanted to imagine uh, what kind of a difference it made to talk about photography in the world. So we are here tonight for, I can't even remember, I think this is episode nine of our photo book club. And I wanted to encourage everyone, if you're tuning in, there's the Q&A function and that's live. And so whether you wanna ask a question of any of our esteemed guests or of uh, anyone, well, not of one another, ask it of our guests, I guess, um, put it in the Q&A and uh, that would be great. I wanna thank our sponsors, Photo Focus. They have made this year our best uh, Aperture Photo Book Club year ever. And I also wanna thank for this book, The Momentary and Image Veve, who have played instrumental roles in bringing this project and this book to fruition. So thank you all for that. Um, I think without further ado, we'll go to introduce our guests and then we'll dive right into the conversation. So I'm joined by the extraordinary artist, Christine Potter. Um, it's not really, maybe it's a coincidence that we're both <laughs> wearing green um, and we're both sort of, I'm sort of a redhead, real redhead. Um, but we are thrilled to have been working with you on this. We also have Rebecca Bengal with us um, who wrote the essay in the book and who just coincidentally also wrote um, this book, the essays in this book, Strange Waters, Photography, Memory, and the Lives of Artists that Aperture published earlier this summer. So we're thrilled to have you. We have Julia Schaefer who designed this extraordinary book, partnering with Leslie and Christine on it. And so we'll dive into all of those design details in a moment. And our wonderful editor-at-large, Leslie Martin, who um, orchestrates all of the parts that make these things come together at Aperture. Um, so welcome all, we're so glad you're here. Um, we decided this was our first all-female photo book club, which is fantastic, um, seems kind of fitting too. And why don't we begin by giving everyone at home a chance to dive into the book narrated by Leslie. Um, so Clark, can we take it away and do our little flip through? Here we go. Okay, so I really love to think of this book as um, Southern Gothic noir. It's a body of work that continues Christine's engagement with the American landscape as a place where our ideals, dreams, and fears play out. And in particular, Im these images take up a set of ideas around within the American imagination of the murder ballad and the American South. It's a series of landscapes and um, glimpse scenes, these really amazing studio portraits, very evocative, of women who are stand-ins for the often unnamed women who are the subjects of the murder ballad. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about the murder ballad, so I won't get into it that much. It's suffice to say that there are 
lyrics from these ballads sprinkled throughout the book. Um, and these murder ballads have their roots in the 19th and early 20th century, but continue to be re-recorded to this day. This is an example, very famously, Knoxville Girl. Um, but all in all, the, the work evokes the atmosphere of being a woman alone in a hostile landscape, and it's rich with sedu seductive details, a sumptuousness that both underlies, underscores, and belies the palpability of these threats. Rebecca Bengal lends a very haunting short story that works in parallel to the images and bouncing this sense of anxiety and foreboding that Christine infuses in each of her images. And together, it's really deliciously compelling, a little bit chilling, and a wonderful book. Hear, hear. I agree. Um, so let's let the let's look at the last back cover. Fantastic. So maybe we'll begin with you, Christine, and tell us a little bit about this series, how you how you thought about it, when you started working on it, how it evolved. Yeah. Um, first, thanks thanks for having us. This is super fun. Um, I I will say that whenever I talk about the origins of this work, it never sounds like what the final product is. And so... <laughs> like all exciting things. <laughs> yeah, I start with very, like, just threads of interest and, and sort of the meaning. Um, the meaning really evolves as the work is being developed and um, reflected upon and so forth. But um, I will say that I, I started, um, I think, in 2015, around 2015, 2016, um, thinking about the American South, I had been working out west, dealing with ideas of manifest destiny and 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 sort of the whole mythology that um, is represented in the American West. And I decided to come back to the American South, and um, you know, n notions of the American Gothic were on my mind. The kind of um, cultural tendencies that a lot of writers and filmmakers and artists had had in the South was on my mind. Um, and I, I decided to um, approach the landscape with thinking about um, like the history of violence in the landscape and whether there was some kind of echo of that, um, whether that was the basis of the influence for some of these Southern Gothic tendencies. About a year into, well, I'll say that the architecture then for that was to follow bodies of water that had violent names. So uh, I would map out a road trip for myself. I would go from Bloody Creek to Dead Man's Branch. By yourself? To, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and um, and and that's actually a kind of critical component because you know I have to get deep into these landscapes to access the water, and then you know so now I'm alone in this landscape, and um, you know certain ideas come to mind, and that energy that you know that 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 ever present sort of like awareness that I can run into somebody down by the water, I often do. Um, I th I think began to inform how the pictures. Um, were made, what they look like. Um, not too long into that process, I became really interested in murder ballads as this very particular kind of cultural output from the South. And and murder ballads, we can talk more about them later if you want, but oh, I no, can just... Here, let's actually, let's pause for a sure. second. Like, how would you define a murder ballad? I mean, I would I would say murder ballads, and I'm I'm no true historian here, but um, sort of <laughs> originate in um, the British Isles and came over with settlers and um, Appalachian musicians. Really took to like repurposing a lot of these murder ballads um, with Sorry. southern. Sorry, he with, decided he would. He's it's not that he's not it. interested. I love it. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so these songs have been repurposed, many of them rewritten with, um, you know, um, real places in the American South or real histories of, of murder, murders um, in the American South. And so if you think about broadsides as, you know, one way of telling stories, um, then the murder ballad is another. And the ones that interested me the most, and, and you know, murder ballads 
detail a murder, um, could be anyone, but there is a very significant subset of them that detail the murder of a woman at the hands of a man. Um, for whatever inconvenience she kind of represents, and that story is the same as it's always been. Um, and that sort of interested me. So that became another component in the work. Um, and, you know, the ways in which I used that as I was making work is different than, how, in some ways, different than how it's utilized in the book. But um, I did decide to step out of the landscape and, um, and, and make some portraits of women in a studio. Mm -hmm. And those portraits are um, very much informed by um, the real characters in these songs. And you know, I'm, I'm sort of bringing um, them into the studio and re-photographing them or photographing them. Um, yeah. Example. Yeah. Um, and there's one other kind of portrait in there too. Do you want to? Sure. There's, there's, you know, I, I, I don't know what percentage of the book is made out in the, in the quote unquote real world, but, um, a, a large percentage of the pictures are made that way. And so, um, there are pictures made, um, on the periphery of these bodies of water or in the little towns and hamlets that sort of, um, are close to these spaces. So um, people I people I meet when I'm when and I'm I was thinking of like these, oh, yes, kind also, of these kind of things too. Also okay. those two. There's a fourth component, which is the storytellers themselves. Um, and so I I have some balladeers, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a little bit. Can you talk about what made you want to see this body of work? of work as a book. So, you know, in other words, it exists as a series of pictures that has the these multiple parts. But what made you think I always um, want a book. Okay. Full stop. <laughs> photographers We feel the same way. Photographers always want books because it, it you know, exhibitions are wonderful and, and and can create their own experiences of course, but the book is, is really something much more democratic, mm -hmm. as you said, and something I think the best part about producing a book is you can produce the experience and then someone can revisit it over and over and over for years and years, hopefully. Um, and that each visit sort of presents new opportunities for questions, for revelations, for meaning to evolve. Um, and, and yeah, for me, it's always, it's always about the book. I mean, yeah. I agree. And yeah. uh, maybe that's a, a good, moment and maybe Rebecca you would well either one of you could talk about this but it's a book that has the sort of haunting beauty that begins to be suggested uh, with the cover that echoes through the pictures that echoes through your writing and the lyrics but maybe is there you know is there something is there something about the book form that you think helps introduce these ideas you know it's not a tv show it's a it's a book and sort of how that grap how you grapple with these you i mean know, we, we the i mean we tend to read it in a linear way mm -hmm. so um that there is there is the task of finding the beginning and the middle and the end and that does i think present some really interesting problems to solve about the story you want to tell and the experience you want to set up for people for the viewers and and how you want to you know, guide them without kind of burdening them or, or overburdening them with your particular way of reading the work. To me, it's like a fascinating challenge um, to figure out. And, and of course, you know, there's all these other components that are at play and, and some of them um, become compromises um, that you have to make and, and some of them become these, these like kind of spectacular um, moments where I think something can happen in a book, for example, with text, that's very hard to accomplish on the wall because no one's gonna stand in front of a long text at a wall, you know. So text in particular is really operative in this book and I think it's, it's a component that can only exist in the book. So maybe that's a good idea to talk about. You know, we've reassembled your dream team here. Yes. <laughs> but maybe will you talk a little bit about what, you know, how how this dream team came together and then maybe Rebecca and Julia you can speak to that yeah. too from your perspective. Yeah. And Leslie too. I mean, so you know, so much of like I said, so much of the meaning of this book came through the reflection and the editing. And so while I thought while I thought the work was very much about, you know, this other thing, like the Southern Gothic thing. It's over there, I can go look at it. 
um, the, the more I edited the work, the more I realized it was as much about my psyche, my experience of being a woman in the landscape, um, my perception of the world based on all the stories that I've heard, my sense of um, you know, power or vulnerability in any particular space is so informed by so many of these stories. And so you know, that was revealing itself to me as I was editing the work. And so I started editing towards that goal. And when it came time to make a book, um, the only clear thought I had, um, because there's always many, but the only clear thought I had was, I want everyone around that table to understand that instinctually. Like, I think people can intellectually understand all kinds of things, but that particular experience of being a woman, I just wanted that to be like this under layer of all the other conversations that we would have. And so, um, when I when I joined forces with Aperture and with Leslie, I said, let's build a team of women. Let's get all women at the table and see what happens. So that's. So L Leslie, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the approach to uh, Rebecca or Julia or, or, well, I mean, or I think Rebecca or Julia, you guys do you want to talk about how it was? Yeah. Yeah, you guys had already started some conversations, and of course, Rebecca, your interests in photography and music and coming from an area of the South, those seemed like such a great fit. So I think you had suggested this, and we were like, yes, that's the great fit. And then I had been working with Julia on another project, and um, just thought that, in particular, your sense of type and how it might weave throughout the work would be a really good match as well. Yeah, we knew so. we were going to be dealing with a lot of text, um, and I loved the idea. I just loved the idea. I don't know that it was like when your when your work came up, it was very clear. For some reason, it was very clear to me, like her. <laughs> Um, so maybe we'll start. The two of you, uh, Christina and Rebecca, I'm saying, uh, did a podcast recently with Sasha Wolf for Photo Work, which, uh, if you haven't heard it, it's a really great deep dive into double deep dive. Uh, yeah, a double deep dive. Um, so uh, I think uh, we're going to put that link in the chat because it, it's worth listening to. But would you maybe talk a little bit about your sort of uh, point to some of the commonalities that brought you together in thinking about this project? Sure. I mean, I think when, when Christine first, when we first talked about it, it was like on the street in New York after, um, after an exhibit that Christine was involved in, but still it turns, and I had been working on that writing with Paul Graham. So this is a few years ago, and I think we just, it was just this instinctive yeah. bond, and we kind of got on the subject of that. And, she, and you kind of vaguely described what you were working on, but I was so excited by like whatever you said at that moment then, but also just in, the, in knowing that we've, drinks. there might have been a few drinks. There was a lot going on that night, but, um, but yeah, so there was um, just this, it was, you know, I, I just responded. I mean, I'd been thinking about these things for a long time too, and, and kind of about the short story that I eventually wrote for this book sort of those characters and some of the things in it were things that were already sort of cooking in one part of my brain. So it was just exciting to hear that you had been thinking about them in this in this other way. And then it was, you know, it was months maybe before I saw the photographs. So yeah. there was a long it was kind of nice to have this like conversation about the music and then that was sort of this background playing in my head. But um, but yeah, I guess one of the main obvious things is that we both grew up in rural parts of the South, um, me in Western North Carolina, and kind of like at the very southern end of the Appalachians, and then Christine in rural Georgia. And and kind of as we were talking with Sasha, just realized that both of us didn't travel that far from where we lived, but we're like around all these different parts. And then also just we're super influenced by the music, not just around us, because that's just there, and you kind of absorb it, and the landscapes that you're in, the woods that you're playing in, the, the just that kind of growing up. 
but also like MTV yeah. <laughs> deeply. Mm-hmm. Which used, Deep, which which used to show of... music, by the way. <laughs> used yeah, to yeah, play yeah, music. Yeah. So pre, yeah, pre-internet um, kind of That was your access to the world. And then pop culture. And then there's something about that maybe that like, maybe that kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe that kind of does something to the idea of, there's such an idea of performance in the book and in the photographs and that's really exciting to me. But I think... Yeah, maybe maybe that sort of shaped, you know, you, you just like absorb a lot of things like awesome. that growing up. So, yeah, we had this kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, and and um, when it came time to really think about text for the book, we had a lot of ideas. And I mentioned to Leslie, I said, well, I, I know you guys are already doing something with Rebecca and maybe may, maybe you're not going to love this idea. But I think, sh- you know, sh- I just want to ask her to write a piece of fiction, you know, a short story, not something about my work, just something atmospherically in the mm-hmm. same space. And Leslie just was like, absolutely, it's perfect. Um, and we gave you very little um, instructions. Which was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, actually. I just had full faith that, that what she, based on like just these few conversations we had had, I had full faith that she was going to write something really amazing, and you did. So, thank you, thank you. No, it was. I mean, again, thank you both for your trust and openness in that because I think that, um, especially, it was so. I love these photographs so much, and they're they really struck a chord in me when I saw them, and just all the different levels. We described some of the different types and. Some of them definitely, we t- I had told you back when we first started talking about this, about specific experiences of just growing up in a landscape where there were murder ballads. There was a famous one from my town that was actually the flip. And I mean, it's, it's echoed a little bit in the story. That's I make a few references to certain songs. And that one was of a woman who actually was the murderer. But of course, the reasons that she was the murderer were because of a violent man in her life. Um, she was the first woman, the first white woman, I guess, hanged in my home county. But so I grew up, like, I remember seeing a performance of that um, that was like a one-woman play that actually reminded me of the curtains and even some of the lighting of the photographs. And there were a lot of other other specific references, too, but I didn't want to use them too directly, just kind of. And I, I remember just spending a lot of time with the pictures and then sort of putting those away and just trying to, you know, I've absorbed that and kind of went back to these characters that I had in my head, these two girls and the father and the mother who's mostly off the page. She's there a little bit. And this uncle who's not present but is part of the, the story's called Blood Harmony. So it kind of echoed the murder ballad thing a little, a bit, but... Uh, not too directly. Know, yeah. not, I didn't. I, there's, there's like such an amazing ambiguity and such a, such a violence, and beauty and like just all these different things that are going on so that I wanted to be able to echo in some way that, without, illustrating. That was the only thing. <laughs> so maybe that's a good moment to talk about how you, Julia, take all of the various, you know, in other words, you're given a group of pictures, you, you know, I presume that the idea of including the lyrics, well, anyway, talk us a little bit about how you take all of these ideas that are handed or what the process was like, because there are a lot of really specific and fascinating design decisions. And I feel like we should show them as we're talking about them too. So um, tell us a little bit about the process from your perspective. Yeah. So first of all, when I got introduced to Christine and your work, I was looking through the images and I was, I have never been to the South, but I was immediately sort of felt that unease without you even saying it, but sort of like that, that, um, sort of like things came up in my head about this landscape. I grew up in a very small town and sort of also moving through forests a lot and like thinking about these moments back home. It was not so much about murder ballads, more about demons and monsters that live in the woods. But it was like I I could really like um, understand we'll where you're that coming from. Next. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I want to make that um, book. And um, yeah, I was so captivated and, and mesmerized. And the, the images are so rich. They're so detailed. 
um, sometimes you discover a character after kind of like seeing the landscape, which was also kind of exciting, like looking through them or discovering these women's, women um, in, in the works. Um, and then, yeah, it was a lot of it at the beginning was sequencing, like a lot of discussions around kind of what is the stories we're going to tell. Um, and maybe, Krishi, maybe you'd like talk us through, a, would you talk us through a sequence? Like, I'll pick a spot. Ready? Or, I mean, you pick you pick a spot. I pick know, what's a the spot. sequence that you, because um, I think Sarah. that idea of how you choose where mm -hmm. the breaks are and what, to me, they, they feel almost like, you know, like visual paragraphs. And so maybe if you talk everyone through how one of those is constructed, I think it would be interesting. So I think it also has to do with how kind of the book is made, the sort of for formally, um, and it's divided into these 12 page signatures. So we always have these sort of green uncoded pages um, like this, that kind of divide the book into these. If you tell me these, what page you're starting on, I can hold it up. Just and the then beginning. You, okay. Um, <clears throat> on the uncoded pages and then sort of the sequence start and then kind of end again after 12 pages, um, get kind of interrupted again with a green page that on the verso has um, the lyrics. We can talk more about that in a second. And then kind of the next sequence starts. And I think what is so interesting about a couple of the images is that they're really you don't really know as a viewer what is up, what is down. So that was also really interesting to kind of guide the eye on the pages, sort of like thinking about here, for example, she's um, pressing out water in her hair and sort of like on the next page, we see that something sort of dripped into the water. So thinking about how these things could, um, how this person or, or the story could unfold. Um, or like when you look up as a viewer, maybe the image is placed on the top of the page. When you look down, it's at the bottom. So it's kind of like as if you were in the landscape looking. Um, uh, that was sort of like one sort of visual through line. It's interesting. I, I'm now I'm looking at it, and of course, it's like when you're looking out, you're looking across the landscape in a very even way, and it's placed on the page that way. And yeah, it's very I probably subtle. looked at this book, I don't know, a lot. And, you know, and the clouds are up. And the, anyway, fat, I, yeah, I hadn't and picked up on that. I think it's also interesting. It could be a cloud up, but it could also be a reflection. Oh, in the that's water. What, yeah, that's water. Yeah. Um, I so, mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so still, and that's really the kind of marvel of photographing water is it's, you know, never twice the same, and it's either reflective or deep. But yeah, I love that we chose to put those up as if the, it's the sky, but really I'm looking mm -hmm. directly it, down. Yeah, it totally speaks to like eyes darting around and feeling the, those yeah. feelings that really, it's, yeah. it's so genius. Yeah. Um, or here, I think the image, this is probably hard to see, but um, the images, I think, flipped. So this was one image that was like, oh, here really. What page is you that, don't know. Um Just in case you're tuning in. That is home. page 58, 59. Um, where if, you, you really if you go to the page before that, it's the woman, I think. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the mini chap chapter, if you will, of um, just pure disorientation. So the woman is spun around. It's the only portrait that isn't confronting the viewer. So she's spinning. And then you get to the next page, and, and the, the landscape itself now is, is spinning. But I see it more as like, you know, the point of view is falling mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you get to an area where you're looking up and down at the same time. Um, so complete disorientation. And then straight down into water directly, black water, impenetrable, you know, terrifying. And then, and then finally, in my mind, um, looking straight up, um, in my mind, lay, you know, laying down in the landscape, looking, looking straight up. And then, and then the response to that, um, which is defiance, I think, um, some notion of defiance, yeah. So I think like kind of like how does the body move through the landscape kind of informed also 
kind of very slightly how the, the images were sort of positioned. And will you talk a little bit about how the lyrics that that introduce each one of these chapters, because they have a very specific treatment that I think is um, notable. Yeah, that was a, we tried a lot there typographically and we landed on the kind of crossing out the parts where kind of that are the most graphically violent towards a woman. Sometimes it said he stabbed her, he shot her. So we didn't want to erase those words. That was also, we, we tried that too, but it didn't feel right because it was like as if it wouldn't exist in the world. And we wanted to have it there, but not have it highlighted either. So that felt like a way to kind of um, to acknowledge it, but also challenge exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. I think this and was important, I think. Yeah, yeah. How, to, how to maybe not perpetuate it, but also maybe how to take some agency over it, you know? And, and Julia mocked up all of these different treatments where, you know, we erased it. We, in, in some cases, we made those words, um, you know, semi transparent. You know, they were kind of fading away. There were, there were bold white marks, there were black marks, and then you came with the idea of making the strike through the color of the paper, essentially, just this, which I, which turned out to be kind of the most beautiful solution. Um, and it's also kind of, you need to look twice, yeah. so it's not like the word is like popping out, but you kind of have to. Yeah, it interrupts it. It interrupts yeah. it, and um, I think that felt like the right tone for what we wanted to achieve with the sort of violence um, that, yeah, we didn't want to take out, but... And I think also it was a way to kind of how they're set, they're like centered, um, set in italics, sort of referencing a lyric or song lyric, but not having it too kind of on the nose. It's, you know, this is music, but... And not it, too big. And not too We're big. on the edge of almost too small, but that's how I like it. Yeah. Leslie Mann, I'd love to hear you respond to the uh, big small. Well, that I, you know, it's I, all it's all compromises <laughs> or any all, part any part of that. It's yeah. all compromises, yeah. but yeah. Well, I like how that gesture. I mean, the only word I can think of when I think of that is cleave. It sort of cleaves the word in half, which is a very sort of 19th century, 20th century word, and. Also, I love how you put um, in Rebecca's text the sort of dividing mm -hmm. elements. There are these things that are drawn from musical notation. Again, very subtle, but just a sort of all these things are a reinforcement of the ideas that you know you've brought to the table and that you bring to the table, and sort of creating these just small flourishes that keep it from being too plain. It's like there's not any black text in there. The text is a PMS, very dark PMS green, in fact. So there's sort of like the voice of the book that's in that green and then dropped down for your text and the lyrics. It's just all very nicely stitched together like a quilt. Or... Leslie, maybe you talk a little bit about the cover too and how, or any of you, all of you, other than Rebecca, you and I'll be quiet. <laughs> You can, say, you, you can say you to say like about it. the cover too. Right. You can talk about the cover too. Yeah, maybe we should make you talk <laughs> yeah. about the cover. Rebecca, <laughs> what do you see in the cover? Right. Maybe we should ask the printer to talk yeah. about it. Exactly. <laughs> or our production uh, person, Andrea Clad, who worked very hard to get just the perfect shade of green and to get the reproduction of the cover just right. And um, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but it 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 was a lot of work. And well, maybe you can talk a little bit about like the materiality, you know, how do you render what's a, a velvet curtain, the backdrop of the balladeers on the stage? It turns out it's way more difficult than it, like you look at this cover and you wouldn't. You, you think it's so like straightforward. Exactly, yeah. it was very hard one, but yeah, it, so this is a velvet curtain and it's, you know, it's green. To me, it's, you know, it's two things. It's, it's the green of the canopy when you're, when you're deep in the forest and it's the stage. Um, and these are really the two components that intersect in the work. And, um, you know, we had all kinds of ideas. Do we make a cloth cover? Can we make a velvet cover? Turns out, 
no, not really. <laughs> okay, so then do, maybe we should just do green fabric, but then it started to feel, like certain decisions started to feel uh, maybe too traditional in a way that some of us wanted to avoid or, you know, Anyways, we bounced back at so many ideas and so many designs from Julia, and we kept coming back to the curtain. So, okay, how do we do the curtain? Well, it's a photograph. Do we print the photograph and tip it in on the front, or do can't? And I said, well, you know, let's just make a, a curtain front and back. That should be easy, right? <laughs> right? Um, but Sounds then, easy enough. <laughs> no, but it's like remarkable how a, a picture like this doesn't print very well on most anything. So we printed it on fabrics. Um, we thought about screen printing. Am I going on too long? No, Cause I mean, we, this really, this right. constituted probably six months of work somehow. But um, we, we ended up finding, and it, you, can you maybe speak to this paper that we used? Well, it's actually a know. very standard book binding cloth called Wiblin and it's meant to be printed on and stamped into, which is why we were just talking about how clean the stamping is, and it holds the ink really well. Over time, you might lose a little, you know, it might get a little uh, scuffed at the edges. But just like a worn velvet curtain. Just right? like a worn velvet <laughs> curtain. Just like that. But um, we had a version that is perhaps encountered out in the world with a spotlight that we tried very hard to get to make um, function, and that, just the simplicity of it in the end seemed to be what really worked the best and really highlighting the title, the beautiful typeface that we also uh, spent a lot of time talking through. Again, it looks fairly classic, but it's... Wait, what are our adjectives? What are the, yeah. <laughs> it was sharp. Wasn't it, wasn't it witchy? Witchy. witchy. And a little sexy. And a little sexy. Yeah. Sharp, witchy, and a little sexy. Yes. That's this font. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I also like that Does it, it feels a, a little... Or, I, <laughs> yeah, song bleu. Okay. Which means uh, bleu, a song is song yep. the blood. So I was like, oh, it's kind blue of blood. interesting. Yeah. Um, and it feels also a little dangerous. Which yeah. It's got a sharp edge. Yeah. Um, the one piece of the design that we haven't talked about or the book is that toward the back, uh, just before the list of plates, there's a list of all of the recordings of each of the songs whose lyrics um, punctuate each of these chapters. And Christine, do you want to? It's 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 not all the recordings, but it's some of the recordings. Okay, so some of these songs have been recorded over a hundred times, okay. um, and so and we in really surprising ways, like outside yeah. of these genres. I think is important. Yeah, yeah. who's recording? And I do made think it into so much pop culture. I do think that we have crafted a Spotify playlist. Why? Yes, we have. Yeah. Thank so you. so pop stay, it in the comments. Yeah, if you look in um, the, I don't know if it's the chat. It's probably the chat. Um, yeah, Christine yeah. and Brianna kindly pulled together a playlist of these. We some of these and then some others, actually, Brianna had some really great okay, additions. Great. But, um, but I will Thank say you, it, it felt important to me, um, and this is a good place to say this, like, you, you know, you read these ballads and it, it feels very niche and it feels very far away, like old timey and, and not really um, indicative of like a contemporary song or a contemporary circumstance necessarily. And for me, it was really important that those songs are used, um, like kind of as like a placeholder, but I really want you to think about culture broadly, the, the movies we watch, the television we watch, the dead girl trope or the abused woman trope is, is as popular today as it ever was. Um, and so for me, like one way of doing that in the book was to say, okay, so for each of these ballads, let's give 10, an example of 10, just 10 of the recordings, because maybe there's hundreds of them. And let's try to choose, you know, the very first recording through the most recent recording. And so if you look in here, you might see Pretty Polly was first recorded in 1925, but it was also recorded in 2013 by Vandevere. So, and, and you know, every decade in between. So um, it's not just these yeah. ballads, but for me, it was important to say like, we, th these are traditions. They're very much considered part of the American songbook. Um, but the tradition of telling these kinds of stories is, um, you know, culturally um, pretty consistent across. 
and present today. And I mean, present you, today. I, yeah, yeah, 2013 is one of the older of the more recent yeah, recordings. Exactly. Here. Exactly. So, well, anyway, I'm looking forward to the playlist. Yeah. And maybe while we're on the topic of sort of music and narrative, Rebecca, you obviously think a lot about music. Do you want to, you know, do you have any musings about the crafting of either the arc of a song, the arc of a book, the arc of an essay, you know, how these things might connect for you? Um, I guess we touched on it maybe a little bit before, but just that sense of, um, I think, I think a book, when you're, when you're talking about the relationship between words and pictures and all these different elements in a book, the, all the design elements that Leslie touched on too, that, that are subtle, like little pointers, those are all things that are sort of playing in, in your mind. And, um, and, and again, like a book will allow you to enter into, enter into a space in so many different ways. And of course, there are subtle ways that your eye is being drawn in different places and maybe to different um, parts of text. And I also just love those chapters as being their own little curtains opening and closing. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I, I never, I like the give and take nature of, um, of words and pictures in a book. And sometimes, it's a little more dynamic where they're speaking to each other throughout. Sometimes there's more separation. There's never one, one way for it to work, but it, but it allows, I just, again, I love the ambiguity. I love yeah. that there's no, there's no read. I went, you know, and, and I wanted to feel like, I wanted the story to feel like you were moving through this world too. And, and to also be, the short story also started very much with sound and with the, I just think, I think in the way that things are heard and said out loud. And so that was, that was very present for this particular book. Um, but yeah, this, and I guess Blood Harmony is, I mean, to kind of draw out a metaphor, Blood Harmony is the name of the short story, which was another idea I've been thinking about a lot. And that's, um, I guess when I first read, there's this great biography about the Leuven brothers whose songs are in here. And the Leuven brothers were these brothers in Kentucky who um, like recorded all these songs and they've been recorded by more, you know, in other contexts, like Graham Parsons did a ton of their songs, um, but they hated each other. They <laughs> really? could not. Oh my God. There's this song. They, they did this great, really campy record cover called Satan is Real. And there's a book that is that biog that is like their biography and they couldn't stand each other. So there was like violence in their relationship, but they made the most beautiful harmonies. And so that concept of blood harmony kind of comes out of that of like your, or I mean that, that, that's an exaggeration of it. A blood, you know, blood harmony can be anything. As I say in the book, I think it's like this idea, or as I see it, it's like someone that you're related to can harmonize in a certain way because they can, they just sort of consciously can fill that space that, you know, the, the melody and the harmony sort of fusing together. And, um, yeah, it's true of a lot of, I think the, Ever, the Everly brothers supposedly couldn't stand each other either. And, you know, again, but they managed like on the stage, they're in this place. So I was kind of fascinated by that. And I wanted, that's, that's the, the main thing that I wanted to steal for the, the older brothers, the, the father character in this book and the unseen uncle. But yeah, so maybe, maybe photography, you know, maybe words and pictures and design can have a kind of blood harmony too. Um, <laughs> if someone wants, if someone wants to fund us hatred. making yeah. this movie, yeah, right? sure. I'm so sure. I don't know. That. I don't know. That's, that's, <laughs> I'm so sure she can extend Down this into road. like a full. But it's so yeah, it's so cinematic and so yeah. Um, but I did want to say one thing about the cover, which is not from a thought, but like that cover. And I, I think I've told you this. My good. elementary school that I went to for all six years because we didn't move um, public school. That was the auditorium's curtain. Like the stage curtain like was that green. green. Yeah. It was yeah. that green. So we didn't have any like dark, sexy, witchy lettering. No, <laughs> no dangerous lettering. But I guess that was maybe just the school color or one of them. But but it just it, it was so crazy to see that and to stare at that again and, and that and to just go back to those. And again, behind the school, like behind the mountain behind the auditorium was like a mountain range. So it just it just fit to yeah weirdly perfectly <laughs> that's 
That's what we knew the first time we <laughs> talked about this, long before the cover even came into the picture. Did you ever think about making any of the pictures in color? Um, I make a lot of pictures I in know, color. I know, I <laughs> know. Um, I mean, a lot of these pictures are actually shot digitally, which is pretty new for me. Um, at least in, you know, outside of editorial work, you know, this, this, my, my, my personal work. Um, it's, it's, I mean, one of the things I really wanted to contribute, if we can think about it this way, art history being this long, long epic dinner, dinner table, um, was just a, a description of the South that was deeply descriptive and deeply descriptive in ways that I felt like I wasn't seeing yet. Um, and, and by that, I mean like just the darkness. Mm -hmm. um, and these digital sensors now really allow you to make very fast pictures in really, really low light, which I can't do with my four by five or an eight by 10, both of which I employed at the beginning of this, um, of this work and when I started bringing digital out into the field um, there was this crispness to the description that got me really excited I mean it's like I mean ultimately I mean for all the kind of heavy subject matter I'm having a lot of fun when I'm out <laughs> making work like I do this because it, it brings me joy and um, yeah I was just seeing things that I hadn't been able to describe before and so that was a, a really important component. So I see we have a question about the audience for this book. Like, who are you making this for? Did you have me? Yeah. Like, did you, <laughs> you know, in other words, do, so, who did you? Um, and then maybe we'll ask Leslie to answer the same question, because obviously, as the editor, you also think about who the audience is for the book. But when I, you're... Did you have I mean, someone such, in mind? No, it's such a good question because, I mean, I do, I do think any artist is kind of self-motivated, like, to go out in the world and make work. But, you know, you're making a book, you are thinking about people's experiences when they encounter it. But f for me, I'm really interested in what the ambiguity can offer. So, you know, something between specificity and deep detail and ambiguity. Somewhere somewhere in that spectrum is the space for meaning and interpretation and and experience and and hopefully emotion. And I do and I and I have you know, I've heard from different people like their experience of the book is different depending on what what life they're bringing to the table or what day they're kind of day they're having or what, you know, what their worldview is. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it's for every, it, maybe it's for anybody who, mm -hmm. who, who wants to give it the attention and spend time and, and invest their own sort of emotional energy in it. So everyone. And, and, and well, and maybe Julia, maybe you'll, I'd also be interested to hear you answer that. Like, you know, how do you think about what, how much you want to make evident through the design, you know, and where there, that, you know, Christine mentioned making the font sort of sm just small enough to be slightly squinty, maybe. Um, but just as you're don't thinking. Like big font. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or that, or that. Um, the large print edition of <laughs> Dark right, Waters. We'll do, the, is, we'll do the geriatric edition next. I know. But, um, Everyone gets a set of reading glasses. <laughs> Um, but are there other design things where you think like this is going to help make this idea more accessible for an audience? Totally. I think one thing that Leslie also brought up really early and I think we agreed on is that the viewer really goes in through the images first and the text is sort of accompanying it later. So just to exactly kind of what Christine said that you go in with this sort of like with these open eyes and you imagine yourself in these landscapes, you imagine yourself moving through and reality and fiction kind of mix up and you make your own version. And I think, um, you know, these are very subtle, these are very subtle decisions, but they really make it make a difference, even though somebody of course could look at the book from, from the back. But as a, as a designer, you just suggest things and, in a book, right? And the, the experience is very individual and personal. I mean, one of those decisions was, and it came, I don't know when in our sequencing this came, but to put this picture at the very beginning before the title page. And this picture wasn't out for, for years for me. It wasn't, it, I, I didn't consider it part of the work. And then 
at the very end, I, I thought, you enter through her thoughts. You enter through the, the woman's psyche. Um, and that kind of sets you up for the re kind of amazing Rebecca Solnit quote, which we haven't you discussed. Read but, it? Yeah, actually. Um, but it was, you know, this was an idea, a design de decision that like sort of separated that, but also gave you a clue about how to enter the work. Um, do you want me to read it? Yeah, why not? Because that, it, that comes up two pages later, so. Yeah, this is um, a quote from Rebecca Solnit's, I don't know if it's her most recent book, it's her, um, it's, uh, a collection of, well, they're all collection of essays. Anyways, um, to be a young woman is to face your own annihilation in innumerable ways or to flee it or the knowledge of it or all of these things at once. The struggle to find a poetry in which your survival rather than your defeat is celebrated, perhaps to find your own voice to insist upon that or to at least find a way to survive amidst an ethos that relishes your erasures and failures is work that many and perhaps most women, young women, have to do. So these are the two things that kind of set you up for how... And then the next page you turn to this. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> um, so, Leslie, there was another question about, you know, how a monograph or how a photo book in particular can support a photographer and, you know, all of these decisions of bringing together the designer, the writer, the artist, and, you know, helping guide and advise on these things. So you want to talk a little bit about, like, what was in your mind as you're making this book? And Yeah, I mean, I think as one approaches any project, it's a little bit about how do you build a platform for that work that can be experienced through the eyes of an ideal viewer or any viewer. What do you need to bring to support the work, the you know, an amazing piece of fiction that will sort of augment and amplify atmosphere, the text elements and how those are underscored, again, as sort of like, a, it's like a setting of a beautiful jewel in a ring, you know, that's, that's very critical to how one sees it and how it functions in the world. Um, so that's, and, and listening, just listening to what Christine wanted to say and how you saw the work and you know you already had these narratives the storytelling aspect is sort of how to how to draw that out and how to to connect it through each of these decisions so it's it's really just i always call it's sort of like a shepherdess just keeping keeping the things moving you know towards on time that and on goal. budget too which is no small feat so oh, we'll, keep, we'll give you the credit for yeah. that too yeah. um and so maybe, I don't know, for our last question, you know, you alluded to this a little bit, like why, why, why did we as Aperture decide to, you know, this actually, this was a book that was in play even before I arrived at Aperture, but it does feel particularly urgent and timely to be sharing in the world, unfortunately, in some ways, many ways even. Um, but maybe do any of you want to offer some concluding thoughts of like what what this book means to you today or why why you feel that sense of urgency? I mean, other than you finished the series and it's nice to share. It. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it all feels urgent to me. Um, I'm just inc <laughs> I'm incredibly grateful to work with um, with Aperture and with this kind of amazing team of creators, um, it, yeah, it just feels urgent for me to get the work out there. I, I can't speak from the outside of it. I'm no. too I'm too far on the inside of it, so I, I don't know. I would just say about urgency, maybe one thing that I meant to say before when we talk about the ambiguity in the photographs, there's one thing that's so amazing about them is there's they can feel very anachronistic. They could belong to a lot of different mm -hmm. times, So, which another way of saying that is like they're very timeless, and all the things in these stories and the songs which are embedded in the landscape that we drive past all the time and wander and wander through all the time is like they're still here. So they're surrounding us always. So that that sense of timelessness is also it, it could just always be here. But then there's like a new way of looking at it. And and um, as, as Julia was describing it, like getting the moving through the pictures, like help you. You're just sort of forming your idea and then and then maybe text Maybe you're starting to put it into words, but either way, it's like through this vision that that makes it, I think, more 
immediate. <laughs> I also think about um, kind of what you talked about at the beginning, kind of why a book also being very much in control of the images, in control of the, like how you want to approach this work, how you want it to be seen, and in, in what sort of um, framework. And I think it's, yeah, it's kind of a way of having agency over the images, which, as we talked before, this lovely talk started, but when you have a work that's f floating digitally, you never know kind of where yeah, it goes. Yeah, you lose and, control of it. You lose and control, just, and I think that's really special about yeah. a book and kind of compiling that into exactly how you, you want it. Yeah, I wish it weren't as timely as it is today because you know we feel that we've made advancements and women do have agency over themselves, their bodies, their um, ability to move through a landscape on one hand in a way that they didn't 100 years ago, 150 years on the other hand, we've gained rights and agency and we've lost them. And to your point, this sense of violence and the need to control and, you know, I love that one image of the baby that's in there, you know, maybe that was the fatal sin that the woman committed before she was killed. Maybe she had a baby, maybe she didn't have a baby. You know, there's a lot of things that are tied up here in how women are allowed to be the sort of captains of their own lives or not. And this just, and, and the fact that it is such a spectacle on TV, when I go home and my mom and dad are watching TV, I'm like, why is there always a dead woman at the beginning of these shows? Well, and it's this, just... you know, to, you know, to, to speak to that urgency, it, I mean, something about, I mean, just our engagement with art in general creates a sense of self-awareness. It's a mirror to, to our, to our society. And I think sometimes you don't realize, you know, the water you're floating in until, you, I, I don't, I don't know what the analogy is, but you don't realize how much of that you're consuming until you go, oh gosh, I can't believe that ballad. That's so insane, you know. Yeah. But it's well, no, you're right. You you're, just you're, spent you're, six hours watching right. a serial television show about the exact same thing. So um, there is some there is some kind of self awareness I think that happens for some people when they when they engage when they with the work. Slow down enough to engage it, you know, engage with it in this form. So I think. Um, Thank you. Uh, you know, thank all four of you for joining us tonight. Thank you to Photo Focus for supporting the Photo Book Club and to Image Vive, who were so important in imagining, you know, in helping. Oh, um, yeah, supporting the work and, and helping with the production of the book. And so thank just, you, Image Vive. Thank, thank, you. thank you, The Momentary. More to come on that. A big exhibition opening next spring. And we want, if you're in New York City and you're watching live, you get a chance to see Rebecca and Christine uh, live in person tomorrow night at ICP, 6.30 p.m. If I'm not, six to eight, six to eight, eight yeah. sorry, six to eight tomorrow night at ICP. And if you are a photo book maker, and we know from listening to our audience that many of you are, um, the photo, the 2023 Perry Photo Aperture Photo Book Award um, submissions are open now. And that's open through September 8th, which is the deadline. But September 8th means that we at Aperture have to have received it. So uh, we'll put the note in the chat if you have a photo book that you want to share. Uh, we would really love to see it. Um, this is ineligible, sorry, because it's an Aperture book, um, but it doesn't stop us from loving it. And um, thank you so much. Have a great night. Oh, and the discount. Yeah. Oh, the discount. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, thank you. That's yeah. so important. Yeah. Um, so there's a discount, actually, if you're watching live, the rest of you, sorry, um, for both <laughs> books, uh, both Rebecca's book, Strange Hours, and for Christine's book. And all of the details are also in the chat. So that that is a good, important detail, um, a twofer. Because we like you to know, help like save to, you like money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is really important. So thank you all. Have a good night. And especially thanks to Christine, Rebecca, Julia, and Leslie. Yay.